Now, the United States has threatened to take further action against South Sudan government if it does not end violence and allow United Nations peacekeepers to do their job. But then, the Russia, uh, Russia has warned against such a move. A month after U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, visited South Sudan and met with President Silva Kiir in the capital, Juba, she told the U.N. Security Council words are no longer sufficient. The United States is prepared to pursue additional members, measures against the government, or any party for that matter, if they do not act to end the violence and ease the suffering in South Sudan. The Trump administration imposed sanctions in September on two senior South Sudanese officials and the former army chief for their role in the civil war and attacks against civilians. However, any U.S. push for the U.N. Security Council to take further action against South Sudan is likely to be resisted by veto power of Russia. The council sanctioned several senior South Sudanese officials on both sides of the conflict in 2015. But a U.S. bid to impose an arms embargo in December 2016 failed. It is counterproductive to impose targeted sanctions, counterproductive to impose an arms embargo, as such measures will not help to break this deadlock and will only further exacerbate the crisis. South Sudan spiraled into civil war in late 2013, two years after gaining independence from Sudan and a third of the 12 million population have fled their homes. The conflict was sparked by a feud between Kir, Adinka, and his former deputy, Rik Moshar, a Nur, who's been held in South Africa. We view as unjust the ongoing attempts to place all blame for the persistent unabated violence on Juba alone. It has done its role. Now the opposition must reciprocate. UN sanctions monitors reported earlier this month that despite the catastrophic conditions across South Sudan, armed forces, groups and militia, particularly those affiliated with Kir and Vice President Taban Dengai, continue to actively impede humanitarian and peacekeeping operations. A Zimbabwean court has found activist Faso Evan Mawariwe not guilty of subversion in a case that has been scrutinized as a barometer of independence of the courts under the new president, Emerson Mangagwa. Mawariwe has been a strong critic of former president Robin Mugabe, who was forced to resign after 37 years in power last week under pressure from the army and the ruling ZANU-PF party. Meanwhile, he has warned President Mangagwa to respect the democratic rights of the people a risk of fate similar to the former president, Robert Mugabe. I am absolutely elated today that um, the courts have decided after considering the evidence that came before them that I am not guilty and that um, the charges that were leveled against me I do not hold any water and of course they have proceeded to, uh, to discharge me on both charges, uh, one which was the main charge which was um, uh, subverting a constitutional government and the alternative charge which was inciting public violence. Um, I think it's a, it's a very welcome ruling. Uh, I found the judgment to be very precise in so far as pronouncement of citizens' rights are concerned in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of freedom of association, in terms of freedom of uh, imparting and distributing ideas. Also of uh, key note is uh, uh, an issue which has not had uh, an opportunity to be determined by the courts, uh, the issue of the right of every citizen to challenge and support the policies of government. So um, this is how, what has happened. The pastor is a free man, he has been acquitted of all the charges, and we welcome the judgment. Now here's a sad one now as four soldiers have been killed overnight in Cameroon's English-speaking southwest province. A government source is quoted as saying four soldiers were killed in the morning in the early hours in the Mamfe area. In the last year, there's also been a crackdown by the armed forces on protests in English-speaking regions in the west of the country where people are complaining of marginalization in mainly French-speaking Cameroon. Abdul Fattah al-Sisi has given the army three months to secure and stabilize the region. No group has uh, said it carried out the attack, although there is considerable evidence pointing to the Egyptian branch of the so-called Islamic State. There has been unrest and violence in the northern Sinai for many years, but it has intensified recently. The Egyptian authorities have vowed to end it before, but failed.
Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says it's only with cooperation that Islamist militants like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab and jihadists fighting in Sinai can be defeated. Netanyahu was in Nairobi for the inauguration of Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, but did not go to the stadium with the other heads of state and government because of security concerns. He later met Kenyatta and other state leaders at State House in Nairobi and called on leaders to work together to defeat the barbarians. The challenge that we face is also security. There is a savage disease. It rampages so many countries. Boko Haram, Ashabab, the, the awful jihadists in the Sinai. This is a threat to all of us. And I believe that we can cooperate with other countries, between us and with others. And if we work together, we'll defeat the barbarians. Our people deserve better. We can provide it for them. Coming up after the break, channels, televisions, political satire, the other news returns for the second season. Do join us again.